Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord, to share the word of God. Pray that you touch our hearts today. Help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. For if we're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we'll never be able to receive what you have for us today. So touch us and help us, Lord, to pay attention to what you're saying to our heart and what you're saying to our life today. Bless everyone who is participating in the service uh, right now as we're currently conducting it. And those who will view later in some other time, we pray that you'll bless them and, and uh, help their lives to be a, an honor to you and uh, praise to you. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love and your mercy to us in your precious name. Amen. All right, every service we begin by singing the chorus of that wonderful song, How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> Amen, amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. I try to make sure that we have two hymns at least and usually two choruses and that kind of balances out. See, we have a chorus to begin, a chorus to end, and two hymns in the middle and that kind of balances, balances it out for all of you OCD people. All right, this song says, we've come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. to his house and gathered in his name to worship him we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord let us worship him Jesus Christ the Lord so forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him so forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him so forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship Christ the Lord worship him Jesus Christ the Lord and let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him oh let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him oh lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord let us worship him Jesus Christ the Lord let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him Lift up holy hands and magnify his name 
and worship Him. Oh, let us lift up holy hands and magnify His name and worship Christ the Lord. Oh, let us worship Him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. What a wonderful privilege we have to be able to worship the Lord, giving God honor and praise. The second hymn is called At Calvary. This is an old hymn, of course, been around a long time, but what a wonderful message it conveys to us. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not was my Lord was crucified, knowing not it worth for me he died at Calvary. Thank God for what he did at Calvary. Well, years I spent in vanity and pride, Carry not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Oh, mercy there was great and grace was free. And pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I'd spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary oh mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me and there my burden so found liberty at Calvary and now I've given to Jesus everything and now I gladly own him as my king now my raptured soul can only sing Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free and pardon there multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary oh the love that drew salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man and oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary great and grace was free and pardon there was multiplied to me and there my burden so found liberty at Calvary oh mercy there was great and grace was free and pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Thank the Lord for what he did for us at Calvary. Amen. You can be seated. My message today is entitled, Let Praise Be Your Song. You know, there's a lot of circumstantial things going on around us that tries to take our song away. Uh, you know, usually when people become despondent and sad, uh, they don't sing, right? If they're burdened down and they're cast down and the cares of life has overwhelmed them and uh, they just, they, they're living in gloom, uh, they don't sing. So the enemy knows that it works that way. So what he does is try to crowd our life with the cares of life and he tries to overwhelm us by circumstances around us in order to take our song away. But I want you to know that that doesn't happen, have to happen in your life. You can keep your song. Let praise be your song. Praise is wonderful, isn't it? Praising God. 
Amen. Isn't it wonderful to be able to praise God? I mean, just think about this. Here we are, finite human beings on this earth, spinning out here in the, in the space. And uh, we have the opportunity to praise God, to lift our voices and praise God. Uh, you know that true praise can only be offered by God's children who have been redeemed by his son. Do you understand that you have a unique role in this earth as a redeemed person who praises God? Have you ever considered that your praise is welcomed in the, into the kingdom of God? Now, look, there are millions of people, millions and millions of people on this earth who do not praise God. They have no experience with God. They have no confession of Jesus Christ. They have no reason to praise God, so they don't praise God. And in fact, they're not even able to praise God. Only the redeemed children of God are able to exalt in the Lord and praise the Lord. The unrighteous do not praise God. A rebellious heart does not praise God. Lovers of sin do not praise God. Followers of Satan do not praise God. Jealous and self-centered people do not praise God. Those in love with this world and its wicked vices do not praise God. You get the idea of what I'm saying? False religions and cults and those who engage in witchcraft and spiritism, they do not praise God. Alcoholics, drug addicts, sex, sexual deviants, child molesters, human traffickers, abusers, terrorists, and murderers do not praise God. So who praises God? The redeemed praise God. Those who have been set free from the chains of sin, those who love and trust the Lord Jesus, those who have accepted his lordship and have surrendered to his care, they're the ones who praise God. Now, aren't you glad you're one of them? I am. I am glad I'm one of them. I, I am so glad that I am not aligned with all of these other negatives that I just read, you, this long list of people who don't praise God. And I am glad that I'm counted on the side of those who lift up my voice and praise the Lord. I'm glad I'm one of them. I want you to listen to these wonderful scriptures and you'll see that this is just a snapshot of the life that you have in Christ and the devotion you have to him. Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him, my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song, I give thanks to him. Psalm 95, Two verses, uh, verse 2 through 3. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Psalm 104. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Psalm 106. Praise the Lord and give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. I have one more verse, and that's going to form the foundation of my message. So I want you to remember all these things that God's done for you and all the reasons you have to praise him, all the reasons you have to magnify his name. I've chosen this verse because it succinctly enumerates all of the bounty of God's blessing in your life. Listen to Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, I want to break that verse down just kind of a thought at a time and help you remember why you have so much for which to praise God. He said in verse number one, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his name. Do you remind yourself to praise the Lord? Look, I'm going to tell you, if you don't remind yourself to praise the Lord, you're going to forget. Because the, the, the cares of life around you are going to just crowd in against you. And if you don't consciously discipline yourself to remind yourself to praise the Lord, uh, the stress of dealing with all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of people will distract you and cause you to neglect praising him. Now, probably most of you that are listening to me have no problem uh, dealing with people who are negative. Uh, you just probably don't have that in your life. All right. <laughs> You probably have no, no uh, situations at all where people just bore on you and just give you a bad time. Well, of course, we all do. But we, might, we have to make sure that those things do not distract us from praising the Lord. It's necessary for us sometimes to talk to ourselves. Now, maybe you do that all the time. I don't know. But it's necessary for you sometimes to just look in the mirror and say, look, get your act together. 
You're a child of God. You're not of this world. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Uh, your goal is a higher place. Your home is somewhere else. Get your act together. Remember whose child you are and praise the Lord. Amen. Sometimes we have to talk to ourselves, uh, to our inner man, to our spirit. Get our attention and our focus on praise. And I want to tell you, if you don't do that, nobody's going to do it for you. Even if you're sitting in church, no one can get your focus adjusted in order to make you worship and praise God. You're the one that does that. You know, we, we come to church on Sunday and we got people all over in this auditorium, you know, and uh, uh, some of them are praising God and some of them are not. But nobody in this house can cause you to refocus for you to get your mind on God. You have to do that. Now, of course, the Lord helps you and his Holy Spirit helps you. But you have to make the effort to do that. David said, let all that is within me praise his holy name. It's important that you control the all that is in you. If you allow yourself to be controlled by people, you're not going to praise the Lord. If you allow the spirit of this world to influence you, you're not going to praise the Lord. If you give permission to your flesh to control your spirit, you're not going to praise him. You have to take control of all that is within you. Discipline yourself. Understand that you individually, personally, singularly are responsible for, before God for the praise that you give to the Lord. The very idea that we can bless his holy name is remarkable. I mean, look. The Bible said, if necessary, the rocks will cry out to the Lord. But the rocks have no sense of, of salvation. They have no sense of redemption. The only creatures on this earth, the only creatures in all of God's creation that can praise God and bless his holy name for, for what he's done for them in salvation are redeemed people. We need to understand that our ability is to bless his holy name. That wasn't created by man. It was created by the Lord. God opened up the door to his eternal throne room to welcome us in. I, you know, I can't even verbalize how remarkable that is. God himself tore down the dividing curtain that separated mankind from his holy room and welcomed everyone in because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of, the, of his one and only son, Jesus. You remember that story when Jesus was on the cross, the veil of the temple, this huge monstrosity of a, of a, of a curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. God ripped it apart so that humanity can come into his presence through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad you have access to his presence? I'm telling you, it is far more glorious than I can explain. It is far more glorious than I can verbalize that we have access into the presence of God and he has given us that access. It isn't something that we just reached up and snatched out of thin air. It's not something that someone else has given us. God has given us access into his presence into his presence. And so we praise him for that. The song that emanates out of our spirit, the song that flows out of us is a song of praise to the Lord for his redemptive work in our life through Jesus Christ. Verse number two says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Christians need to take time to think about the blessings of the Lord. Don't measure your blessings by the world's measuring stick because the world's measuring stick is always based on comparisons. In other words, what the world says is how am I doing compared to somebody else? Uh, you need to see and understand that your blessings and benefits are designed for you and your life by God. It isn't that someone else uh, puts this blessing in your life. God puts it in your life. And uh, we need to remember that God works his will in you as an individual person and your benefits are designed for you by God. God knows what you need. He knows his plans for you. And if you can see the benefits of God in your life only as a comparative measurement to somebody else, you'll never be happy. It, it's, it's like people sitting in the church and watching somebody else just praise and worship God and then saying in their heart, boy, I wish I could do that, but I just can't do that. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> Your praise and worship is not controlled by how someone else praises and worships God. Your praise and worship is designed for you, how you praise and worship God. I remember one time a lady, <laughs> a lady came up to Janet. She was, playing the, uh, she was playing the piano during the altar service, and it was a great altar service. And, uh, 
And uh, people were just praising the Lord. People were uh, in all forms of uh, submission to God. You know, it was, a, it was a great Pentecostal service. And Janet was playing the piano, you know, and, and that was offering her worship to the Lord. And this person came up to her and said, if you would just get off that piano bench, the Lord could bless you. Well, now that was stupid because God was blessing her and what she was doing. That was the praise of her song to the Lord. But see, people make that comparative thing. Somebody else is doing this, so you better be doing that, or you're not really praising God. Somebody else is behaving this way. You better do that, or you're not praising God. And nonsense to all of that. Your praise God comes out of your heart and your life. God puts in you the ability to praise him the way you should praise him. David said, don't forget. And that indicates the serious effort that our mind has to apply so that we remember. We do not forget what is God, God has done. The human heart and the human mind can be very fickle and very careless. You've got to discipline yourself to think about it and to remember the benefits of God in your life. If you don't, you'll focus on all the troubles and all the good blessings of God will never be recognized. All you'll see is the darkness and the trouble. It's, it's a good idea for us to set aside some time to just sit down in a chair and just think about the blessings of the Lord. Just think about God's blessing. I remember a great preacher in our denomination, Paul Laverne Walker, pastor at a big church in Atlanta, Georgia. In fact, they started several other churches out of that church, and he went on to become the general overseer, and he still is in Cleveland in a ministry there. And uh, I remember hearing him say one time, uh, you, you know, I, when I find myself just absolutely determined that I'm going to worry about something, he said, I go sit down in the chair. And I say, all right, Walker, you got five minutes. You got five minutes. Do all your worrying. Because five minutes, you're done. And he said, so I would just worry, worry, worry. And I watched my watch, look at my watch. And at five minutes, I got up off the chair and said, okay, that's it. I'm not worrying anymore. Well, that might be a good thing for us to do. Sit down in the chair and say, Lord, I got all your blessings that you've given to me in my life. But my focus tends to be on all this negative stuff I'm having to deal with. So what I want to do, Lord, is just put the diminishing light on that. Let that go into darkness and let the light of your blessings shine in my heart. And it'll surprise you what the Lord will do for you. Count your many blessings, remember? Name them one by one and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Verse number three, he says, he forgives all of your iniquity, which, which means that sins of any kind and all kind will be forgiven by the Lord. Sometimes in our hearts, people do such evil and destructive and mean things that we can never forgive them. Now, we say we do, but we just don't have the capacity to truly forgive them. But do you know what? God forgives. God forgives all sin. All the sin that was in your life, God forgave. Every once in a while, the devil wants to bring it up and remind you of it. But you don't have to pay any attention to that because God forgave your sin. If we only had one benefit from God, if, if only one thing was done for us by the Lord, forgiving us of our sin would be substantially the number one benefit in our life. Now, of course, God does a lot of other things. But if that were only thing that God did for us was to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of unrighteousness and redeem us from our sin, if that was the only thing that God did for us, that would be the most wonderful thing of all. The only one who can forgive sin is the Lord. And he does for every person who will come to him. Every person who will repent of their sin and believe in him, uh, on him as Savior, God will forgive them. He will let the work of Christ on Calvary be ap applicable to their life and forgive them. In this world, we're surrounded by wicked, wickedness of untold dimension. Sometimes it just takes your breath away when you look and see the terrible, terrible wickedness that's in the world. It's like a, it's like a volcanic belch of smoke and fire. It just smothers and destroys people. And it's like an unbreakable web of entrapment and imprisons people. And it's like a heartless assaulter. It, it attacks and it hurts people. It's a demonic spirit. Laughs at its victim and brags about its unbreakable change. But all that wickedness is around us all the time wanting us to stop praising God. But the Spirit anoints us to praise God. Even in the midst of the problem, we praise God. Even in the midst of disappointment, we praise God. Even in the midst of heartache, 
we praise God. I mean, that, that is something that is so unique, and, it, and it, it is only available to children of God, that when all of this stuff is going on, we can still praise God. Jesus will shatter all of sin's bondage. He opens the prison doors for every sinner who will cry out to him for forgiveness and salvation. And David is appealing to the child of God so that they will praise the Lord who delivered them from the power and the degradation and the curse of sin. I mean, you know, we, we only have, we, we're only able to see just a little bit of the dimension of the power and the hatefulness of sin. We see it sometimes in the life of what drugs does to an addict and what uh, alcohol does to an alcoholic and what uh, sexual sins do to sexual deviance. We see little glimpses of the dimension, uh, the horribleness that sin does, but we don't see the real gaping hole of sin which is truly separates people from God. And that's the, that, that's, the greatest, uh, that's the greatest negative about sin, is that it separates people from God. And God said, I will heal that. I will forgive that. I will heal that breach that separates you from me by forgiving you of your sins if you'll just confess your sins to me. And so everyone who comes to the Lord receives forgiveness. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then David went on to say, who heals our diseases in verse number four. Uh, aren't you thankful for the wonderful benefit of healing? Now, healing is often a confusing subject in the church because we see some people healed and other people are not healed. I don't know. I don't presume to know the answer to that conundrum, but I know he heals. And I know that many scriptures remind us that our trials and illnesses and afflictions and hardships can re rebound to the glory of God according to how we deal with them. I believe in divine healing. I've seen people healed in various illnesses over the years. So that's part of my confession of faith. I believe the Lord is our healer. I've also peop seen people who have not been healed. And I don't pass judgment on anyone because I don't have the right to do that. He is the healer. I refuse to try to come up with a reason that some are healed and others are not. I am not the healer. He is. Now, a lot of preachers have made the mistake to try to come up with some erroneous scripture to tell you why you're not healed. But uh, you know, it, that's, a, that's a foolish thing to do. Uh, that, that is an uh, irreconcilable thing to do. I'm not a healer. That preacher is not a healer. I remember Catherine Kuhlman said, I couldn't heal a fly. It is God who is the healer. So I, I, I'd pass no judgment on people who are not healed, even though I know that the scripture said that he heals us. It's interesting that David wrote this verse before Jesus suffered and died on the cross. David knew that the God of his faith was a healer. He knew that healing was to be part of the covenant promises and the law of God. And when Jesus came, he said of himself in Matthew, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to uh, not to destroy, but to fulfill. So in, in the Lord's earthly many, ministry, many people were healed, but some were not. Matthew 12, 15, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself and the great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. That's one of the most wonderful scriptures in the Bible. Great multitudes followed the Lord, and he healed them all. But remember when he went to the pool of Bethesda, all those sick people around the pool of Bethesda, only one man got healed. There's no evidence that this man had any faith at all, yet Jesus healed him. There were many more who needed to be healed, but he only healed this one man. I'm pointed out that God is sovereign. He alone chooses what he will do for any of us. Can unbelief hinder his work? Surely. But what true Christian harbors unbelief in their heart? Let me say that again. Can unbelief hinder his work in us? Sure, in a lot of different ways. But what true Christian has unbelief in their heart? How about sin? Sure, sin can hinder the work of the Lord in us. But what true Christian harbors sin in their heart? I do what the Bible tells me to do about praying for the sick. I honor God's word and pray in faith as much as I am able to do. I know that I do not have the power to heal anyone. God does the healing. I'll not presume to step into God's sovereign place and pronounce healing to anyone. I will pray and I will believe and that's all that I can do. But that's what I will do. But I will not try to tell you why you are not healed. 
And I will not try to pronounce healing on you because I don't believe that's my privilege. Only God has the authority. God is able to heal any disease and any disease, uh, uh, sickness. Ask him to heal you and trust him to do so according to his will and his purpose. You know, when you listen to missionaries tell the stories of their work on the mission field and the great miracles of healing that happens on the missions field, it is just wonderful and glorious and just lifts your spirit. And, and yet here in, in, in America, there is such unbelief and there is such uh, uh, antagonism against spiritual truth and such antagonism against God and, and uh, people have just turned their back on God. It seems in this country where, where the gospel was, was the heartbeat of this country for so many years, it seems in this country that the population, a large part of the population, turned their back on God. And so we don't see the spiritual works that we could see uh, because there is such doubt and such unbelief. My, my encouragement to you, if you're sick, if you need a miracle in your life and in your body, you just keep praying, just keep believing, keep asking God for it. And believe that God will do what God is sovereign and uh, what God or sovereign God will do and believe that he will do for you what he desires to do for you. Now, you know, I tell you, people have a real problem with this and they get really hung up on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you liberty, all right? I, I want to unlock that, that, that lock, all right? I, I want to give you the, the privilege to walk out of that little jail cell and realize that whether healed or not, it does nothing to the glory of God, and it should not diminish your praise to God. He is sovereign. He is Lord. And he will, in the midst of your sickness and in the midst of your illness, be glorified. The very fact that you continue to praise God and love God is a testimony that your relationship with God is not controlled by what happens in this physical body. All right. You got to get that straight. If you don't get that straight, you'll be discouraged and you'll be asking a thousand whys and uh, just trust God's wisdom. All right. When you get to heaven, you can ask him. All right. When you get there, you can ask him, Lord, I, you know, I had this problem. And it just hampered me for so many years. Why didn't you heal me? When you get to heaven, you can ask him that if you want to. But I'm going to give you this guarantee right now. You'll never ask him. That, that statement will never be made. God is merciful. God is good. If all he ever did for us was to save us from our sins, that would have been enough. But he also heals us. Many, many times God heals our bodies. And many times God heals us, I think, when we don't even know that God is healing us. We don't even know how God is keeping us. I'm not trying to be mysterious here, but there are many times we don't even know how God has got his hand on us, protecting us for all these things out here that's trying to do us harm. So anyway, just believe the Lord. If you need to be healed, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't say, well, I'm just not going to pray anymore. Just begin. I mean, just continue to pray. Just continue to believe the Lord and let God's sovereign will be done in your life. In verse number five, he said, who redeems your life from the pit. Before you became a Christian, sin had a chokehold on you. And the devil had a pit with your name on it. He had it all decorated for you. He furnished it with all the evil and unexpected things that you might have, uh, that you might need in order to be housed in the confines until you die. That was the devil's plan. He had this, he had this, this, this jail cell all decorated up just for you. And the sin in your life had you confined in that jail cell. But God had other plans for you. God wanted you to be set free. So he provided a redeemer. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, the, the single solitary reason that you are a Christian today is because God loved you and gave his son to pay the price for your redemption. Don't ever forget that. Uh, you, you're not more important than anybody else. You are a single reason that you are a child of God is that God redeemed you through the precious work of the son. Thank God for that. Jesus paid the price for your redemption. When he was crucified and his blood was spilled, not another, his blood was shed for your salvation. He suffered so you could rise out of the pit of sin. He bled so you could rise out of the pit of sin. He died so you could rise from the pit of sin. He resurrected from the tomb so you could rise from the pit. God wanted you and me and everyone else to rise from the pit of sin's bondage. And so Jesus sets us free. 
And for that reason, we praise him. That's our song. We praise him. He said that in verse number six, that God crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. It's such a rewarding thought that the Lord has a special covering for his children. But it isn't just a simple covering. It is a covering of identity. He crowns his children. Now reach up there. You don't feel it, right? Okay. You don't feel that crown. You're a child of God. It's there. Whether you feel it or not, it's there. Well, it's spiritual, but it's there. And wherever you go, the enemy, he knows who you are. All right. He sees that crown of righteousness on your head. And so he aims for you. Now, the funny thing about that is, uh, you know, he loses so much. It seems like he'd get discouraged after a while, doesn't it? I mean, he, he comes after you and he's thwarted. He has these great plans for your destruction and they all come to nothing. He fires his fiery darts at you and they fall powerless at your feet. It seemed like he would quit, doesn't it? It seemed like he would give up. But I want to tell you, he's got this mental defect. He thinks he's something that he's not. The Bible said he goes about as a roaring lion. See, when the devil looks in his mirror, he sees himself, Roar, this big roaring lion, see? But it's all imaginary. He is not. He is a defeated foe. You got to remember that, all right? Now, we're, we're living this in, in this time where we're going through life, okay? So the enemy keeps trying to do his stuff to us. But as a child of God, you just keep resisting it. And because you keep resisting it, it infuriates him, but he can't do anything about it because God has you covered. The Lord has a, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I mean, think about that. Steadfast means it's unshakable. Steadfast means it doesn't diminish. Steadfast means that it, the power of it remains the same. And he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. So everywhere you go as a child of God and, and the wicked spirits out there see this imagery in you, you are a child of God. And they keep trying to get you, but they can't do it because God has crowned you. It is a covering of identity. He owns his children. He authorizes his children. He gives this covering to his children in their need, in their walk of faith. God protects it. So uh, what is this crown? Is it beautified with encrusted jewels and precious stones? No, I had you reach up there. You didn't feel it. Is it a fashion statement so that Christians can strut and preen? No, because other people don't see the crown. See, you got to understand this. This is a spiritual covering that God has given us. But we can't walk around strutting like we're in some kind of a little beauty pageant. It's a covering to protect God's children from the debris that's in this world. So take advantage of that. Live under that covering. Don't walk away from the covering. Live under the covering that God's provided for you. And that crown of righteousness that God's covered you with. That God has, let me read this again. Steadfast love and mercy. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The crown is not a decorous thing that we have on our head. It's a crown of steadfast love and mercy. And I, as I was mentioning about steadfast, uh, I got ahead of myself because I got the definition here. It's defined as resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. It means unfaltering, persistent, firm, loyal, dependable, faithful, trustworthy, and constant. You can apply all of these words to his love, all of these words to his mercy. He will not fail you. He will not walk away from you. He will not withhold any of his blessings from you as a child of God. You get it all, all right? That's why we sing a song of praise. Verse number seven, we owe people actually like this. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> Now, we got some in the auditorium today that's not very, very old. So this verse is hard for them to understand as far as applying to them physically. But we're not talking about physical, okay? So regardless of your age and our age, our spiritual life is renewed like the eagle. 
He satisfies us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. So what God does, it doesn't make any difference how old you get. You know, your body gets old, but your spirit doesn't. I, I like to tell people, I like to remind people of that. Uh, your body ages, but your spirit doesn't. So what God does with your spirit is that he satisfies you with all of his good blessings and, 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 and all of the vim and vigor and vitality you had as a young Christian. You got it all over again because it never went away. There it is. You fly like the eagle. Now, few things in this world satisfies a child of God. And those few things are always satisfying to the flesh. The good that, God, that the Lord provides us satisfies our spirit, all right? The thing the world provides us satisfies our flesh. So don't misunderstand me. Now, it's, it's not a sin for your, for your flesh to be satisfied unless the element of the satisfaction is sinful. It doesn't bother God at all for you to be blessed and to be happy. In fact, life is better when you are blessed and happy, right? Uh, I, I like that part of life better when things are going well. Uh, than when things are going bad. So the Lord blesses us with all good things, and he doesn't mind that we have satisfying circumstances in our life. But the Lord satisfies us with a goodness that surpasses anything this world can give us. We fly like the eagle. We soar above the tedium and the boredom of this world. I saw a little picture the other day. Uh, it was an eagle and a crow had landed on the eagle. Or it was an, an amazing photograph. The crow had landed on the eagle and its beak had some of the feathers, the neck feathers. Uh, he, he had it in his beak and he was riding that eagle. And uh, the only way that the eagle could rid itself of that crow was just keep going higher and higher and higher. And finally, it got up to a certain point in the atmosphere that the crow could not breathe because it was not designed to live in that atmosphere. And the crow would just fall off of the eagle's back and the eagle was free. And I thought to myself, my, oh my, what a spiritual application that is. You know, the old enemy tries to put stuff on our back and, and weight us down. Here's what we ought to do. We, we mount up with wings as eagles. Here we go. We go higher and higher and higher. And finally, it just falls off because it doesn't have the capacity to live in the atmosphere that God gives us as children of God. So remember that. The world puts us down, but God's goodness lifts us up. The world weighs us down with burdens, but God, God's goodness raises us up to fly higher and higher. The world will suppress us, but God's goodness caresses us. The world wants to limit us to our flesh, but God liberates our spirit. The world wants us to be caged, but the goodness of God sets us free so that we can fly. Praise God. Y'all feel like flying <laughs> as children of God. God has good plans for you, all right? He doesn't have bad plans for you. God has good plans for you. And God's got his hand on you. So don't be discouraged by anything that's going on around you that is negative. Let praise be your song. In fact, if there's a wonderful praise song that you know, just take that and periodically throughout the day, just sing that to the Lord. My wife actually does that. I'll hear her sometime in the other room uh, singing a praise song and giving that praise to the Lord. And uh, it's a good thing for us to do. It focuses us. And I encourage you to do that. Remember, let praise be your song. Aren't you glad you know him? Aren't you glad that Jesus is part of your life? Amen. I am so glad I know the Lord. I am so glad that I was set free from sin. And I'm so glad that I'm not destined for hell. I am destined for heaven. And I'm so glad that the devil can't do anything about that. And the world can't do anything about that. And politics can't do anything about that. I think I'd throw something current there. Politics can't do anything about that. Nobody can do anything about that. I'm on my way to heaven. And the reason I'm on my way there is for what God did in my heart. God did it in my heart. Same thing for you. So don't give up. Let your song lift up before the Lord. Praise, praise, praise. Let praise be your song. I want to close with singing this little chorus that we've often sung when we come into church. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. Give him praise. 
Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. Your voice is raised, your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power unto him. Jesus, the name above all names. All right, let's sing it together. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power unto him. Jesus, the name. to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart your voice is raised your voice is raised give glory and honor and power unto him Jesus the name above all is above all names. Praise the Lord. Thank you again for being part of our service today. Remember, let praise be your song, all right? I pray that you were blessed today. I pray that somebody that heard this message was enriched in your spirit today and that morning manna has impacted you. Uh, as always, I encourage you to share this service with your friends and family on various media outlets. I would appreciate that very, very much. It helps the impact of our ministry reach a lot more lives, and we'd appreciate that if you could do that. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Thank you that we're able to lift our voice in songs of praise to you. Thank you that you welcome us into your presence. I pray every person who has been part of this service today would be blessed Give them a wonderful day, the balance of this week. Let your Holy Spirit be with us, I pray, in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again. God bless you.